Meet Ruby, Hayden, Holly and Tolla. We're following them across the series as they let us know what it's like to be a regular hospital outpatient. They've given us exclusive access to their lives as they undergo treatment. Let's meet our outpatient Holly. Hello, Holly. Hi, everyone. So now I'm going to give you a little tour of my house. So firstly, here is my little brother, Michael. Ooh, nice Hulk outfit. Hey, don't leave me in here. Nine-year-old Holly has cerebral palsy, a condition which impacts muscle control and movement. In my case, it affects all four of my limbs, but it affects my legs a lot more than it does my arms. With cerebral palsy, the brain doesn't communicate properly with the body's muscles. It's like if you're in like a cafe and the Wi-Fi is down, you can't send a text message to someone. This is a table that me and my brother get washed at in the morning instead of me having to stand at the sink and get washed. Cerebral palsy does have quite a big impact on my day-to-day -day life. From appearance, it looks like it's like really painful and it's really hard, but it's really not. You just got to go with the flow and kind of get on with it, you know? This is our accessible shower room. Now I have my shower chair, which I sit in to have a shower because obviously I can't stand up while I'm having a shower. I really like it because I get to do it myself. I have to go to physio with Rosemary in school every one to two weeks. <laughs> Holly has regular physio treatment, not just at school, but also at hospital and at home. You ready? Ta-da! Find out how I get on next time. Bye! One of our favourite hobbies is golf. And I must say, Chris, we're getting pretty good at it. But, like all outdoor sports arenas, the golf course can be a place of danger. You could forget to tie your shoelaces and trip over them. You could hurt your back carrying my clubs around. Or you could be hit on the head by a rogue golf ball. Sand! Duck! <laughs> right, it's my turn to tee off. And just to be safe, I'm going to get well back. There's no need to go that far away. <laughs> Chris? Chris? Uh-oh, Dr Chris has collapsed and he's not responding. Injury alert! <laughs> So what should you do if someone is unresponsive and not breathing? A. Take a selfie with them while they can't refuse. B. Lie down next to them and have a little nap. Or C. Call 999, find an adult and tell them how to do chest compressions and then get an AED or defibrillator. The correct answer is C. Call 999. Find an adult and tell them how to do chest compressions and then get an AED or defibrillator. But will this lot get it right with no training? Are you ready? Yeah! Off you go. go! AJ and Hanitha are both pretending that they've had an accident and are unresponsive and not breathing. Quick, guys, they need your help. Got a phone. OK, you got a phone. Yeah. No, no, no. We need you to come to this location straight away. Well, calling an ambulance is a great start. I can't feel it. Start the compressions. One. They've got into doing chest compressions, but actually they're just squishing his stomach. They're not doing them in the right place at all. Our teams didn't quite get this right. Some ideas were spot on, like Farouk's. I searched to see if she had a phone on her so we could call the ambulance. Others just missed the mark. Tell me about the chest compressions. I don't think I did it too next to his chest. I was doing it near his stomach. Let's show you how it should be done with the help of Jeff. Our first aid dummy. Right, can you see if he's responsive? Jeff? Remember, we're Jeff. showing you what to do in an emergency, but it's always best to get an adult. I'm shaking him gently, but he's not saying anything. What should I do next? Can you check if he's breathing? Yep. Put your ear down next to his mouth, tilt his head back. Can you feel any breaths at all on your ear? No, I can't feel any and I can't hear anything. We need to call 999. OK, I've got a phone here. So you call 999. Give the patient's problem, give your location, and the ambulance service will tell you to start doing chest compressions. Put the heel of your hand in the middle of his chest, 
and start pushing down at that speed twice every second. To do chest compressions, you need a grown-up because it's hard work and requires the stronger power of an adult for it to be effective. So Chris is now doing chest compressions. I need to go and find an AED or defibrillator. An AED or automated external defibrillator can be spotted in schools and public places like sports centers. Now, all AEDs have instructions on them. It's a machine which delivers an electric shock to the heart. Pull green tab to remove pads. There are the pads. Peel pads from liner. Press pads firmly to patient's bare skin. OK, and now you need to move back because I'm going to give a shock. Can you stand back? Jeff isn't responding because he's a dummy. But at the touch of a button, the defibrillator tries to give the heart a kickstart. This machine will talk you through everything you need to do, so the most important thing is to stay calm and listen to the instructions. Do you want to have a go? Yeah! Brilliant. So, if you see someone who's unresponsive and not breathing, call 999, remember you'll need to know your location, then tell an adult how to do chest compressions, and finally, if available, find a defibrillator and follow its voice prompts. Good work, guys. Chris, are you breathing? Oh, yes, I am. I just winded myself. You winded yourself? Is that it? Well, yes, but it was quite a shock at the time. I thought it was some kind of emergency. Well, it's always better to check. I wonder if we should play something else. I've got this basketball with me. OK, all right, ready? One, two, three. Ooh. Winded again. Sand, what are you up to? I'm a bit busy at the moment, Chris. What are you busy with? I'm trying to do 3D printing. Don, that's not how 3D printing works. Well, how does it work if you're so clever, Mr Smarty Pants? Time for investigation out. Do this. Feel your own head. It's the easiest way of getting a sense what your skull is like. But wouldn't it be better if you could actually see it? Well, today, I'm going to do just that. I'm about to come face to face with my own skull. First up, an MRI scanner. It takes pictures of your body, including your tissue, blood vessels, organs, and most importantly today, my bones. The MRI takes thousands of images. It's almost like slicing the skull and taking a picture of each slice. On here, I've got loads of pictures of my head. And we're going to do something that until recently would have seemed like science fiction. That's right. I'm going to print my skull. This is a 3D printer. It's not like a normal printer with ink and paper. This prints things you can pick up and use. But one of the most amazing things it can do is print replacement body parts. And to prove it, I'm going to print an exact copy of my skull. My MRI scan images are sent to this printer, which then prints each slice of my skull as a thin layer of blue glue in this bed of powder until the complete skull is created. In charge of 3D printing at Nottingham University is Dr Glenn Kirkham. So that's your skull. Now they've printed the skull in blue, just for me. It's very, very creepy, actually. If I do that, it's exactly like scratching my own head. He may not look a lot like me, but in fact, the shape of your skull enormously influences the way you look, because no two skulls are alike. Your skull is the only one of its kind in the world. And did you know you have a hole in the back of your head as well? That? Yeah, is so. that just a glitch? With the print? No, you have a little hole in the back of your head. What's a bit odd is I can feel it with this finger on the printed skull, and I can feel exactly the same little hole with this finger on my real skull. That's not right. The 3D printing isn't just fun. It's got a real medical use. Scientists are now 3D printing more complex bits of the body. Even something that seems simple, like your nose, has a bony bit at the top and then soft tissue at the bottom and the latest 3D printers can do both. Meet the mind-blowing, megatastic master of 3D printing. 
What makes this incredible piece of technology different to the one that printed my skull is that it not only prints hard bones using a special plastic and powder, it also prints soft tissue using a gel filled with live cells, which could become real working organs. But to do that, the printer needs to know which order to put the cells in. So, if you want to print a heart, then you need to get the billions of cells in your body into the right order to make a heart. And if you want to make a kidney, then all the cells need to be put in a different order. The way scientists do this is by moving the cells on a computer tablet. This is our digital tweezer system, so this lets us grab individual cells and move them around wherever we want them to go. So unbelievably, my finger is moving cells that are under a microscope in another building. That is awesome. The possibilities with 3D printing are limitless, even within your lifetime. It might be possible that if you damage a bit of your body, you can simply print you another one. Now, isn't that amazing? I think I'd look better in green, though, Chris. Got a question for me? With our ouch bleepers, ready to answer your medical queries. That is a lovely question. <laughs> Just practicing our crossing. Nailed it, Zan. Thanks, Chris. Keep up, Rolls. Oh, saved by the blooper. The first question is from Rahima, who fell off a climbing frame and punctured her liver. Hi, Rahima. Apparently, you have a question for me. Yeah. I fell over and I've got a hole in my liver. The doctor said I don't need an operation, why not? What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like you've got a case of... I fell over and I injured my liver, but the doctors say I don't need an operation and I want to know why not itis. Well, that's a mouthful. The amazing thing about the liver is it can heal itself really well. So if one bit of it gets damaged, the rest of it is able to produce more liver, and that's what we call regeneration. And not all the organs in your body can regenerate, so the liver's quite special. And what's going to happen is, if Rahima sits still for a few days, that will just heal up and get better. Okay. Now, listen, you've injured your liver, and the important thing is that you never, ever go outside and play ever again. I think that's a bit silly, Dr Chris. I think I should just be a bit more careful next time. All right, that does sound a bit more sensible. Rahima, you have earned an ouch sticker for you to place over your liver, OK? Bye! Bye! Good work, Chris. Rox has a question from Cody Ann, who's in hospital because she has a problem with her digestive system. You've got a question for me. What's the central line? Why is it important to keep it clean? What's the diagnosis, Doc? That sounds like a case of... What is the central line? Why does it need to be kept clean itis? <laughs> That's two questions, Cheeky. Do you have a central line, Cody Ann? Yes. OK. Well, a central line is a piece of plastic tubing that goes straight into your chest because sometimes people need special medicines for a really long time. So they need plastic tubing, which is put in their neck or by the front of their chest, and that can deliver medicine straight into the bloodstream. And now for the second question, Ronks. Why is it important to keep it clean? Now, as you know, the world is full of bugs, and that's why we wash our hands. If you don't keep your central line clean, those bugs can get into your system, cause infection, and make you pretty unwell. Thank you so much for showing us your central line. There you go. Thank you. See you later. Bye. The last question is from Callum, who's had an operation on his ear. Have you got a question for me? Why do you get goosebumps when you're cold? What's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds to me like a case of, I want to know why you get goosebumps when you're cold itis. This might have a hair-raising answer. You get goosebumps when you're cold because at the bottom of every hair on your body is a tiny muscle called the erector pili muscle. And when it's cold, that contracts and it lifts your hair up so it's standing up straight. And the idea is that if you're a furry animal, that will lift your hair up and trap warm air near your skin and keep you warm on a cold day. But in humans, we don't have enough fur or hair for that to work. So it's just a leftover natural reflex because we evolved from furry animals. <laughs> well, what? You evolved from a furry animal too. Callum, I'm loving the way your mind works. That was a great question. Would you say that I've answered it? Well, in that case, I can give you a sticker. Question answered. That's it for today. Clinic closed. 
Here's one of our favourite hospital cases. The team in accident and emergency thought they'd seen everything. And then Sam turned up. In accident and emergency is 15-year-old Sam, a budding boxer suffering with sharp pains in his stomach. I've had this pain for quite a few weeks. A stabby, fiery pain. That must have been quite a fight. Who delivered the killer punch? Amir Khan? No, it didn't happen in a fight. It happened in his sleep. Right. It was night time and Sam was in bed. He was fast asleep, dreaming of boxing. That's why he's punching, then. Yes, but inside his stomach, another battle was brewing. I can see what's coming. In the red corner, we have the cramps. They look tough. And in the blue corner, it's the stabbing pains. Nice goatee. This could be a close fight. It was, and it was making Sam pretty uncomfortable. He doesn't look too good. The longer the fight went on, the worse the pain got, until it was too much, and he woke up. Ouch! Off to hospital for Sam. Uh, I don't want it to get in the way uh, of my next fight. Your next fight might have to wait, Sam. First, you've got to overcome the battle in your belly. Meet Dr. Eni Folarami. He'll check our patient out. Does it hurt hair? Or does it hurt hair? So that's, this is one. And this is two. Two? Two. OK. Number two. Remember that bit of a clue. To find out what's going on, Dr Enny sends Sam for an X-ray. And after a quick snapshot, the results are in. Looking at it, he's got lots of faeces poo in his colon. Poo? And in his rectum. Yet all these areas are full of poo. Sam is severely constipated, so he really needs to go to the loo. You're really bummed up. And he doesn't mean your nose. Got poo all over your colon. Your discomfort might be coming from the fact that you're constipated. I can't believe it's poo. <laughs> you better believe it, Mum. In fact, constipation is one of the most common causes of a sore stomach. To get rid of the pain, we need to get rid of that poo. Time for the world champion of poo-fighting medicine, the enema. An enema flushes fluid into Sam's large intestine to soften up the blockage and help Sam have a heavyweight poo. Let's hope this gets things moving. Well, after a night in hospital, have we had any success? He managed to go to the toilet, but the pain in his tummy is still very severe. I've been up most of the night. That stabbing and fiery pain came back. It looks like there'll be more treatment on the cards, so we'll be back for round two of Sam versus the Pooh later on.